We are lucky to have the pioneer of uh, ROP here, Dr. Chopra, and most of us have been trained by him. We owe everything what we know of ROP to Dr. Dogra. Pleasure to have him. This is the last session. We have valedictory after this. I would request everybody to stick to the time. And uh, Dr. Tapas is going to be delivering the keynote address, which uh, online keynote address. Dr. Tapas uh, was a gold medalist in MS ophthalmology. Uh, from uh, then, uh, he did his fellowship from Shankar Netrale Chennai and University of Michigan, USA. Then he has numerous papers and uh, orations and awards to his credit, including the J.M. Pava Award and Colonel Rangachari Award. He's presently in LVP Bhuvneshwar. We have his slides, the audio visual. Yeah, I think they've already projected. Uh, so we can start with the first talk, retinopathy of prematurity, the in-between cases, role of surgery. Very uh, good morning and uh, my deep gratitude to the Victor Retina Society and the eminent ROP specialists of the country. And I take you through this uh, uh, first case of the keynote lecture, which was a case of stage 4B, retinopathy of prematurity, previously treated with anti and laser, underwent lens sparing vitrectomy, and uh, the retina was attached without any break at the end of the surgery and also up to one month. But to my surprise, there was a retinal break with focal area of retina detachment at the posterior pole. And uh, this uh, kept on increasing for another four weeks, prompting us to push the case for surgery. Now on table, um, before doing the re-surgery, we saw that uh, the detachment and the pole was less prominent. And uh, so we deferred the surgery and subsequent follow-up showed that the hole was no more visible, the retina spontaneously got attached. So the, we hypothesized that the, the appearance of the break and finally resolution of the detachment and disappearance could be because of the sealing effect of the residual hyaloid or a tangentially contracting membrane in the presence of a very strong RP pump in infants. Same patient, the other eye had a very opaque uh, retrolentral membrane with uh, stage 4, B stage 5 ROP, some amount of retina was attached, uh, creating a dilemma whether to operate or not. Now, the, some areas of translucency within the membrane helped us take a decision to operate, and we can see that uh, the left eye did very well. Among the various factors in deciding whether to take uh, for a case for surgery or not, the uh, translucency of the retrolateral membrane with visibility of the underlying retinal vessels play an important role for me in uh, taking a decision of whether uh, to operate these cases of stage 5 ROP or not. This was a case of bilateral stage 4A cicatricial ROP referred to us because of the progressive decline in vision in the left eye from 20, 20 to 20 by 100 over the last six months. The, what was the reason for such a decline? OCT across phobia showed that a phobia to be detached, and this led us to revise the diagnosis from stage 4A to stage 5 ROP. Finally, we stated the case for surgery, both uh, vitrectomy and buckle, and uh, the left eye did very well with complete attachment. This was a case of uh, zone 1 posterior aggressive retinopathy of prematurity that did not do well with initial Rani Bijuma. So laser has to be done uh, within a week of injection. And there was a fibrovascular proliferation and tractional retinal detachment 
for around six to seven clock hours in the right eye. And uh, we prepared the consult the parent for a possible surgery. But however, during follow up, the detachment and the prolif regressed remarkably without any need of surgery. So is the detractional retinal detachment progression rather than the absolute clock hours that count in taking a decision whether to operate stage 4 uh, ROP or not. This was again a case of stage 4 a ROP uh, with, which was referred for surgery but uh, aggressive laser both anterior to the ridge and selective regions of the retina posterior to the ridge saw that uh, there was spontaneous avulsion of the prolif with the complete resolution of the detachment. This is unlike diabetic TRD, which usually doesn't resolve with the laser alone. This was a case of hybrid ROP in June 1 posterior with mat like or candle box like pre retinal deposit, the broader here, quite close to the optic disc and a robust highlight. And uh, again, prompted us to keep the parents prepared for the surgery, but as the child was too sick for uh, any intervention, intravitreal antibiotic was given. And to our surprise, within two weeks, the pre-retinal lesions vanished like a butter in a frying, uh, frying pan. And there was no recurrence. After this initial report, we saw similar observations in 21 eyes. So the candle works like deposit of hybrid ROP do very well with medical management alone, but need to be differentiated from hybrovascular prolif with progressive nasal traction that is seen in staged ROP where surgery is the treatment of choice. Sometimes two diseases can coexist, and this was a case of stage 4 A ROP. Subretinal mass lesion referred for surgery. A closer look showed that the subretinal lesion was gliovascular, and the diagnosis was changed to BPRT with, uh, with stage 4 A ROP and anti VEGF laser to the skip areas and over the lesion in multiple sessions saw a complete resolution of the changes that we saw at the presentation and this happened in both the eyes. Here uh, we pre present a case of immaturely born child with uh, pre-retinal hemorrhage and fibrovascular proliferation and posterior detachment on day seven of life quite unusual for ROP. Uh, creating a diagnostic dilemma and uh, what to do next. A closer look at the family history showed that the elderly sleeping was also blind from the birth, making us to, making us to keep FEVR as uh, the utmost in the differential diagnosis. An early vitrectomy was done within 20 days of life and uh, the eyes did well with 20 to 200 vision at five years of age. The last case showed uh, so shows a, a typical blade-like uh, detachment and uh, these uh, detachments are difficult to manage. So, however, early aggressive treatment with laser anti vegf surgery or combination can result in good outcome in many like the case one here in the left eye and with repeat surgery, the right eye also did well. Blade-like posterior combined retinal detachment and severe retinopathy of prematurity or need to be differentiated from purely exudative form of retinal detachment because the former require quick, rapid laser anti or surgery or a combination of therapy to save, save many of these eyes. So to finalize, to summarize, uh, the, there is no rule of thumb. Each case is unique by, in the management of ROP. The stage 4A ROP in many of them can actually be stage 4B OCT that help in taking a decision whether to operate or not. Candle box like pre and deposit in hybrid ROP do well with medical management alone, while the extent, the worsening of the detachment rather than the extent of fractional retinal detachment play an, an important role in deciding whether we plan surgery for them or not. The, unlike diabetic TRDs, the proliferation in cases of ROP can at times auto avulse leading to the resolution of detractional retinal detachment and obviating the need of uh, surgery in uh, many of the cases. Vitreous hemorrhage or TRD too early in life in a prematurely born child 
one need to search for other causes and early surgery after ruling out retinoblastoma can uh, result in good outcome. Finally, one need to be aware of lab-like combined detachments because the outcome is poor and uh, with early aggressive combined therapy, some of these eyes can be saved. Thanking you all for the kind attention. I thank the society again for giving me an opportunity to share these cases. Thank you, Dr. Tapas, for a very nice lecture. And these are truly the in-between cases where we do not have exact guidelines. So for surgery of ROP is really uh, what we all need to plan very carefully, evaluate the patient and then plan it carefully. I would go on to Dr. Dogra for his uh, inputs on this stuff. Uh, I must con congratulate uh, Tapas for bringing out variety of cases which teaches us so much. I think uh, case one, uh, most uh, important uh, from uh, every point of view, retinal break. And this we have encountered, uh, I think I encountered quite a few years back uh, when the retina elevated, uh, Simar is here, he has encountered other cases similar. So I think we need not rush with doing things, many of them, in they close spontaneously, even if there's a detachment, because vitreous is so firm and pump is so strong that I think they close. And that is what we had seen also, a very large macular hole, which happened, which I did surgery and subsequently similar as few cases similar of similar nature, what he showed. So that is something very important. So don't rush because uh, you won't be able to take off the hyaloid. Hyal You're going to make little more problems there. So that is uh, one. And uh, secondly, he mentioned about uh, the same thing, hybrid ROP, uh, which was described by a group long time back. We've put this uh, candle wax as a mat-like proliferation. I think we did see that it used to melt even with laser, but the dramatic uh, uh, resolution, what we are seeing with anti vegf is also something. I think you should not worry. If there is something stuck broad, give anti vegf and it's going to go away. And uh, so that is another one. And he also mentioned, we have seen this. I think we still should believe in our therapies first rather than rushing. Many of his cases, uh, what he presented, they did well with both combination treatment as well as alone with laser. So I think some of these things are uh, very, very important, which we should look into. I would say in ROP, yes, doing less is more. So you should not rush in for surgery, like Dr. Dogra said. Dr. Karobi, please, your inputs on this surgery in ROP. After this, I would like Dr. Diksha to comment on this blister-like ROP. I'm sure she was showing a case of blister-like ROP. If you could good some, uh, give some inputs on this. I agree with uh, There's not every case who's in stage 4 or 4 AB patting or, you know, even the crunch phenomenon when it starts really requires a surgery. Many times you observe the patient do a barrier kind of laser and then we've seen patients who have had proliferations at the arcade with treatment, limited treatment, not rushing in for surgery. Those uh, proliferations have got uh, cornered off to the periphery and we could then safely do a laser around it and uh, of the vision in these children. So I completely agree with Dr. Tapas that in between cases are there and we have to take each patient for its own value. Diksha, please blister ROP. Uh, Dr. Gaurav, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Gaurav. Uh, I must congratulate Dr. Tapas for highlighting so many things and uh, especially regarding the laser because I have been using this uh, kind of a posterior barrage laser for so many cases. In so many cases, they do so well with laser. Even if we have a recurrent proliferation, which is posterior, we add posterior to the ridge laser and lot of times, lot of times, most of the times, the 90% of times, they are going to, you know, do well with laser alone. That is the, you know. One question, Dr. Gaurav, do you go ahead with posterior to the ridge laser right in the first go or only if it's a progressive ROP? No, I, I do it in the first go. In all the cases of threshold ROP as well as pre threshold stage 3 ROP, and it has you know worked very well. It has worked really, really well. It acts as a barrage, even if we have a detachment. Uh, 
it limits of the extent of detachment and uh, if we have uh, proliferation most of the times what happens over a period of time the proliferation lifts up separates into the vitreous as a membrane and uh, you know traction is relieved if you have done a very good posterior laser i usually preserve it for progressive cases dr dogra please last word on this actually this is something which has come off uh, of late uh, i think uh, first one to start doing was nils and then subsequently the other groups uh, dr lingam gopal's uh, group also started doing this and i think what is very important and many cases which used to be sent from far off places because laser was the only modality uh, because uh, you have this traction going on there so there was a scare so uh, that time we were not doing posteriorly but the question is if your vessels are not dilated that is what we used to observe if they are not dilated it's going to separate that's what he has shown spontaneous separation once that proliferation separate everything settles down so i, I think many a times it's not that we have to uh, go with the, this kind of a decision very fast i think we can wait but in case the vessels are dilated then it is going to be pro progressive that is a very important issue then is a progressive traction i think divya and may Dr. have something David. to say i think the uh, dt as ma'am mentioned like the posterior laser don't do in the first go but as you assess how it is responding and if you see that uh, that is not regressing then uh, as, as a rescue thing the posterior laser and many of cases respond well as it was mentioned like after some time it lifts like a vitreous floater should we say that we should go in a staged manner for rop lasers sir i would say that in today's time at least because we also have anti vegfs for more severe cases anyway we are <laughs> these days uh, giving anti vegf in addition so it has become any way procedure which is different from what was traditionally done and just in some of these cases staging them ma'am sometimes within that week that thing lifts up and then you lose the opportunity to do that posterior laser so if you have done it in the first go sometime that's better but even if you are if you are do, doing it stage i think we should see them early maybe 3 4 days if we feel it is progressing or lifting up do the laser at that point wait a week or two it sometimes the trd might progress that much that posterior will go very posterior and to make sure because sometimes it is not very straight forward sometimes you go in thinking this is a stage 2 rop zone 2 and you know sometimes you have a, a stage 3 actually because the uh, uh, proliferation is like flat it's going on the surface of the retina so this is not the stage 3 which is lifted up this is going something like flat and sometimes in examination you miss it now you are doing laser and you don't want it to go bad you add it posterior laser at the first go itself so that is this is five minute i think i missed the initial there in the other hall coordinating for the So, uh, the peripapillary there are a few special cases of late we are seeing that there are peripapillary traction so, uh, there uh, especially with the posterior uh, pole cases so uh, anything specific regarding managing them especially if there is a persistent traction i think one case uh, uh, shown by tapas uh, which is quite educational that if you don't have a progressive uh, his case despite being very posterior uh, regressed uh, just with laser so i think that's also very important question is progressive yeah. that is what the key is if it is progressive then you don't delay then you need to go in early and what is done is that you remove as much vitreous as possible right. you may not touch that it may be very vascular and they'll do very well also, usually it tend to settle down that is what in fact in the beginning we did very minimal we mostly and those days because anti vegfs even were not there so we would just clear the vitreous as much as possible and many of them they would go back and retain so that is what used to be the key even in earlier days so there is a possibility that these patients when the eyeball grows there may be progressive traction probably a close well, later on it will not happen if it has quieted down your vessels which i said dilatation tortuosity has gone down then it doesn't progress we have quite a few cases where you have all the in fact some of them it will you be surprised they have better vision than the other eye which looks better yeah. it is what can happen i think we can take up further questions during the course of our the talks dr komal 
uh, all done, but disease is progressing. I think could take up questions in this after this. What to do? Good morning, everyone. I would be speaking on those cases of retinopathy of prematurity where we have done everything and still the disease is progressing. I would like to acknowledge the team at LV Prasad Eye Institute where previously I worked and most of the pictures that I'm seeing uh, that you would be seeing in my presentation is from my tenure at LVP. So we have a baby like this which who has been lasered, the plus is persisting and there's early traction with a lot of free retinal hemorrhages. What's next? One of the most important factors in ROP that we tend to miss are the systemic factors. Now there are some factors which we don't have control over like the gestational age or the low birth weight of the baby. But factors like oxygen exposure, the duration and the type, anemic status, cardiac issues, sepsis, nutrition and weight gain of the baby are the factors that need to be looked at with the treating neonatologist at all time points when we are treating ROP. My next step is to recheck the diagnosis. Now here you see a baby which was born at 36 weeks had a very poorly vascularized macula along with persistent fetal vasculature causing foveal traction. But if you see carefully you can see some exudates along the persistent fetal vasculature and the, vascul uh, and the other vessels which clinched the diagnosis of FEVR. This baby also had a very strong family history of FEVR and hence was treated with laser and subsequent lens sparing vitrectomy and we could salvage the central vision. A picture like APROP with skin lesions like this, we think of incontinentia pigmenti, uh, which would probably again do better with laser as compared to anti-VEGFs. Many cases of PFV also can be misdiagnosed as ROP, especially if there is a central TRD along with a vitreous hemorrhage. Now if I have a non-responsive ROP which was treated with anti-VEGF, my first step that I tell all my fellows is to identify the failure correctly. If you see this picture, uh, this was for a baby who was diagnosed as APROP and was injected uh, with a Vastin a week back. My fellow was pretty rattled who had injected uh, on the response is not seen, the vessels are still dilated, the plus is persistent, did I not inject properly? But this was a pre-injection picture. If you see and compare, you can see that there was a dramatic response actually and uh, this baby did pretty well and did not need any additional laser subsequently. Now if within a week we actually have a failure, it is probably due to a poor injection technique or an improper dose that was injected uh, and we can consider a re-injection in those cases. However, if there is a recurrence post anti-VEGF, we can consider laser if it is anterior or consider re-injection if it is still in posterior zone 1 as you can see in this picture. Failure of laser which we were just discussing, the first and the foremost thing is to check the adequacy. You can see in the picture the uh, ample amount of skips that are there and just anterior to the traction you have a large amount of area which has not been lasered. Laser in ROP has to be non -con uh, has to be near confluent and covering all the vascular areas. And although this might be a controversy, I would personally uh, opine on doing the posterior to the ridge laser in the first go. If still we have a persistent plus along with uh, uh, along with an adequate laser that has already been done, we can consider an anti VEGF to be supplemented. However, if there's a traction, as Dr. Dogra was just mentioning, an early surgical intervention would do good. We have operated and still there is a failure of surgery. Either it can be an extensive post-op bleed or an in inadequate removal of traction which is causing the further progression. In few of these cases, we can consider resurgery. Vitrectomy if the attraction is posterior and especially anterior posterior and belt buckle in a subset of patients where there's just peripheral circumferential traction. So, for my, for, so my algorithm for a non-responsive ROP is to look at the pre-intervention findings which are causing the uh, non-response, confirm the diagnosis, choose appropriate treatment. If it is an anti vegf failure which is causing that, check response in, a one, in one week and identify failure correctly, 
consider re-injection if posterior disease, consider laser if anterior or if it's a recurrence. If it, is a non if it was non-responsive to laser, check the adequacy of laser, add laser to the skips and posterior to the ridge. If traction is developing, early vitrectomy with or without anti-VEGF can be considered and at all time points correct the systemic parameters. So here's hoping for all the successes for, the, for these little fighters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Komal, for a very nice talk and very nicely summarizing. Like what I think the talk said was that first you need a coordination between neonatologist and the person uh, who is managing ROP from ophthalmology. Then you should differentiate, be sure that your diagnosis is ROP. There's very less, I mean, uh, fever, eye, uh, incontinentia, pigment eye, ROP are very close to each other. So you must differentiate what it is. Documentation is a must, as I could gather from your slides. So is it that we should have documentation for all the cases so that we can uh, reevaluate our findings only that the disease is in progressing or it is improving? So in ideal cases, yes ma'am, I would definitely say that uh, because we don't know really what is going to happen in the future. We have seen cases where it's just an avascular retina and when you're, sec uh, when you're seeing the baby at the second visit, it has started developing ROP and then you know, progressively worsening. So uh, for me, yes, the protocol is to document all cases, uh, if you can. If we don't have a fundus photography, I'm sure the drawings do better. Dr. Devya, what do you think uh, are the basic signs of recurrence? Like she did show many, but what in your uh, experience is the most common sign of recurrence when you say yes, it's uh, progression, sorry, not recurrence, progression. Uh, the uh, dilatation and uh, tortuosity still, uh, I mean, it might have got, uh, you mean the not responding, progression, yeah. So it, it comes back and then you see these uh, subtle hemorrhages which start coming up at the previous uh, edges of the ridges. So these are the few signs which you definitely look for. And uh, usually you don't see much of an NVI coming back so uh, early. And uh, regarding this laser and whether there is a diagnostic dilemma in nowadays actually because of these wide field imaging, actually that really gives us an additional clue actually to say especially regarding this posterior laser whether to do or not. Because you see these vascular loops might be there but in between those will, there will be areas of capillary non-perfusion. So an angiogram actually definitely helps us to pick up these areas and do laser in those. That would be an additional. Do you think angiogram should be a part and parcel of evaluation of I, ROP? I think with time actually, especially in these confusing cases, definitely it adds to it. And, and I think with Dr. Anand Vinaykar's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, they do it most of the cases. Because we also see lots of avascular area which we tend to miss without angiogram. I have a question. Uh, uh, regarding the use of anti vegf one thing which I have noticed especially with a lot of younger people coming in so when they do the first ROP screening and uh, they notice avascular retina sometimes there is some bit of looping and a lot of people will inject anti vegf thinking it to be APROP in fact it is not so that I want to point out because anti vegf is being uh, misused like anything because if you wait sometimes Sometimes they do go into APROP, a vascular retinas. Sometimes you know, the normal vascularization can proceed. And the second question is that that is a question. So, how many times? I mean, I, mean, I have now doing anti VEGF. Not more than once I have given. So, what is the indication for multiple uh, anti VEGF injections, whether with Avastin or uh, Centrix? I want. Uh, here is Diksha, uh, she should comment on that. They have some experience of giving uh, the second injections and they have seen uh, issues with that. I think uh, let her, uh, because uh, this is something, I think there are two things which happen, but let her uh, first. Uh. I think sir, part of this question will be covered in my talk where we did the uh, protocol of a second injection in an exclusive cohort of zone one. And uh, with the second injection, we haven't seen vascularization getting completed in any of the eyes, but that is the experience with ranibizumab that I have, not with bevacizumab. So none of the eyes actually ended up having a vascularization. For those that have been previously injected and lasered and have a recurrence, 
I should we should be very very careful of a repeat injection because we have had crunch phenomena. So we should look at actually what Dr. Komal said that whether your laser is adequate. If you have the facility of doing an angiogram, do that and see if there are areas of new vascularization or uh, avascularity and treat those. That is going to help more rather than a second injection. I just wanted to make one point here, sir. Like Dr. Gaurav just mentioned on the misuse of anti vegf especially in those cases which we feel are borderline and are not yet APROP. So, uh, what we have seen in many cases, I actually recently had a case uh, which, in my opinion, was probably injected very, very early elsewhere and then was sent to me where I, I could just see the disc and there were just a few twigs coming out of it. I could not, I was struggling to actually find out the retinal vessels in those cases. So I was not sure how actually that was diagnosed as an, uh, you know, APROP and was injected Accentrix. And that was the baby that I showed uh, as one of the pictures there. Four weeks later had a recurrence and the vessels were still in, you know, it was it was not even posterior zone one, it was so very posterior and I really had no other option to act, uh, to do, uh, I could not do a laser, so I had to re-inject. So yeah, the use of anti-VEGF uh, is, you know, it's, it's very advantageous but it has to be taken with a pinch of salt and not just, you know, go on injecting left, right, center in all cases. What is the that time is... window? You go ahead, sir. I'm going. Uh, it was a half zone or it I it was injected elsewhere so I don't know but yeah. I could not identify uh, anything it was just the disc and few twigs and I was uh, mostly it's like that uh, there's one comment which I, to, I wanted to make see what happens is when ranibizumab is given intravitreal the half-life is very short, so sometimes you need to repeat that injection because you don't get the adequate response. But vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this is map, we've seen that one injection suffices and it covers that window period, you know. And the effectivity also of closure of vessels, I find, is much better with map as compared to randomism. That was one point. And the second point, you spoke about the tortuosity. See, this is a very, very important sign. To cite a small example, there was one patient who was referred to me. She is doing ROP herself, so she used to send the patients for cross-referral and to see whether her treatment is fine or not. So there was like she was doing the treatment, she had done a nice treatment, but there was still uh, tortuosity of the blood vessels, which was persistent. So I told her, add her a little more posterior to the ridge. And uh, so she did it, but she was... Dif uh, like diffident to come closer to the arcades but there was only one vessel which was which was pers persisting with tortuosity and she said madam it looks good I said no it doesn't look good even that has to straighten out so I said okay we'll wait and see but keep a watch every week and at the end of five weeks it manifested a sprout so this is the sign of a smoldering disease which is there which you have to be very careful to evaluate if you let this patient go in saying that everything is fine, you'll end up in this. One more question, Vitris here. Sir, can I have a small question, please? So, Krishna Murthy, what can be missed in ROP school? Outside, I would like to thank VRSI, Dr. Mahesh and Mugam and Divyansh for this opportunity. Babies born in small towns, babies who get trained for ROP but miss their follow-up, babies who have received anti-VEGF for zone 1 disease, and babies entirely fall out of our national guidance for screening. These are the common misses we see in most of our ROP programs. Babies being born in small towns, they miss out because there's nobody to screen them. However, those who do make it to the big cities, they fail to come back for repeat screening. Babies who get screened first in the NICU, 
they miss their follow-ups commonly because they graduate out of the NICUs. Many times they move out of the place to their native and sometimes the importance of continued screening may not be uh, understood by the parents completely. In order to address these two important points, we developed a telescreening model, which basically has the backbone as an electronic medical record, which is cloud-based. You know, the entire data of the baby is captured in electronic medical records. The technician and the team creates an EMR for the baby, images the retina, uploads the NICU data and images, and follows up with the parents to ensure that follow-up is complete. The doctor in the team reviews the images and decides on the next follow-up date or the course of action. There's a program manager who coordinates with the technician and the NICUs, and he also coordinates with the neonatologist and the VR surgeon in case laser treatment is required, which is delivered in the NICUs when the baby with ROP is identified. This is roughly a workflow. You can see here that the patient's data is registered first, they get screened and then diagnosed, an appointment is scheduled. If the baby does not turn up for the appointment, then the technician calls up the parents and then another appointment is rescheduled in the same location the uh, following week. This is roughly what happens in the outreach. The ROP team, the technician with the driver, reaches the designated NICU with a red cam. The identified babies for screening are dilated. Then wide angle photos are taken. The NICU data of the baby, the photographs are all uploaded onto the registered electronic medical record which is created there. Each baby is linked to the neonatologist who's treating it as well as to the location and the NICU. So follow-ups are easy to bring them back to the same place repeatedly. Once all this data is uploaded, it is available uh, distantly to the ophthalmologist, reviews these images, and he gives his opinion on the diagnosis as well as appointment on the next follow-up date. It is followed up by the technician later. This ensures that we are able to track every single missed baby digitally. So more than 10,000 babies screened so far cover half the state of Karnataka and more than 1,000 lasers have been performed through this program. The second common cohort is those with zone 1 disease which have been treated with anti -VHS. Here, post-injection, the disease regresses beautifully. However, two to three months later, there is ROP which develops once again. Many of these babies need to be followed up very closely, much longer than we would like to follow. I'll show this with you, with, I'll illustrate this with an example. Here's a baby which is 28 weeks gestational age, first screened three weeks of birth, immature retina which you see there. However, I'm not sure whether you're able to appreciate that, but here you see that there is developed zone one disease. Fovea is not vascularized. It's hardly reached half a this diameter from the thing. And it worsened, an injection was given of anti-VEGF. This is two weeks post anti-VEGF. You can see that the vessels have straightened beautifully and it's proceeding again towards the ora serrata. However, at 51 weeks post-conceptional age, that is baby is almost six months old now, you can see that in, there is a stage two ROP developing in zone two, and uh, this needs laser. You can't leave this behind. Maybe it's as it is quite big. Post laser at 58 weeks post conceptional age, 30 weeks old, it regresses completely. This is the problem that you will have because bigger the baby becomes, more difficult it becomes for you to screen after that and treat if you have to. The last set is those who are above 34 weeks, above 2,000 grams birth weight fall out of your screening net entirely. We now 10,000 uh, 10, babies screened. We had about 150 babies who had ROP who were above the screening guidelines. Uh, the challenge here is the neonatologist decides who gets screened in this cohort. However, the rate of weight gain in postnatal period seems to be a sensitive parameter. We've looked at our data and we found that if there's a less than 19% body weight gain in a two week interval, up to the age of 40 weeks post-conceptional age, it significantly increases the risk of developing ROP. In the process of trying to quantify this more efficiently so that we can identify babies who tend to go and develop this, and uh, open for comments and suggestions regarding this. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Murthy, for a very nice presentation, which is the need of the day.
Uh, I would just, uh, I think Dr. Dogra can just summarize briefly what we need to screen and how we I need to I think this is the most important part yeah. uh, which has been touched. Uh, but what we have to realize is where is where are your babies coming with stage 5? That is where the problem is. And they are all coming from peripheral centers. They are all coming from SNCUs as well as from the places. Most of the pediatrician, these are not neonatologists, those who are taking care. Some of them are medical officers even. And they don't even know what are the guidelines. They don't even know when to screen. They want them. So I think we want to go a little beyond as far as the awareness part is concerned and uh, communicating to them we should have some kind of a, uh, a part of these SNCUs and others that we have these uh, posters or something projected there that this baby if it is two kgs 34 weeks has to be screened in two to three weeks after birth whatever way there is even a now way where even Anybody coming from maybe anywhere from private, they will also be compensated. You see, so there are various ways, but we need a lot of awareness. We are getting a lot of stage five babies and their number will go up. You'll have more and more higher birth weight babies coming with severe ROP from outside, which has been our concern in the beginning and it is going to be a bigger concern. So awareness, I think, is the single most. How we have to do it, I think it's very, very, I think we have an ambassador here in uh, Karobi. She's trying her best and we have to disseminate much more this kind of information uh, because the problem is IROP uh, society doesn't have neonatologist pediatrician as part and perhaps they'll never be because if they make them a part they'll t uh, over, uh, every, overtake the IROP society because their number is larger. So it happens these are practical difficulties which we have seen. So the question is we have to do something about this. This is uh, and all of us all of us uh, we have to disseminate this. Thank you, sir. I would invite Dr. Karobi for her next talk. Questions we'll take up later on at the end of the thing in, uh, of the session in interest of the time. When and which anti VEGF I choose? Why? Good morning. Thank the VRSI for giving me the opportunity. And, uh, my topic today is on when and which anti vegfs do I choose and why? Understanding the VEGF expression is very important because that helps us in determining the timing of ROP management. We know that there are two phases of ROP. The first one is the vaso-obliterative phase where the VEGF levels are low and it is a, a phase of relative hyperoxia. So anti vegf drugs are contraindicated in this phase because VEGF is not elevated. And this is from 22 weeks to 30 weeks. Whereas in the second phase, which is between 31 to 44, this is a period of high risk development of ROP. And this is where the anti VEGFs generally work well. So what do we do? Do we do a primary treatment or do we do a rescue? Now, there are a lot of uh, uh, surgeons who think that, you know, who uh, sort of, they say that the first line of therapy should be injections and that should be the only uh, uh, suggested treatment which should be given. But we uh, tend to believe otherwise because my belief personally and many others also think that laser is still the gold standard treatment for ROP. Yes, anti vegfs are very helpful in cases where we had problems with lasers or some patients where we, we we predict problems, we generally would love to treat them because we get a better outcome. And what are these conditions? These conditions are one is the APROP, zone one disease, then the half zone ROP where, uh, as Komal said, you twigs coming out of the optic nerve and you know, that's how it is. Patients who have non-dilating pupils because they have a heavy tunica vascular lentis, a very, very sick child who cannot be subjected to laser a stress or an advanced stage 3 in an APROP which needs treatment simultaneously with laser and injection. So these are a few examples. This is the APROP cases. This is a half zone ROP. Then this is an advanced stage 3 with a little amount of bleed. This is another case of advanced stage 3 ROP. And this is a child with a heavy tunica vascular xylentis and a very sick child who's in the NICU who needs to be treated over there, sometimes through the incubator as Dr. Mangat has designed it for us. 
Why? Why do we do it? Because there is a quick pro progression in half zone ROP. It progresses by leaps and bounds. So we have to do treatment very effectively and well. And the delineation of the macula is difficult. So you don't know what you're treating. If you do the laser, you might just go across the macula because it's still defined. And it has a quick stabilizing effect of the anti vegfs are known. Now, first, photo is to stabilize and then to secure and be safe. Now, there are patients where we do a laser, but later we have to do anti vegfs So these are cases where there is a progression despite your uh, full laser treatment where you have done every uh, uh, area possible. Non-regression despite laser, in fulminant or advanced cases with laser, and where there is a small sprout which is there uh, in, uh, at the border of zone 1 where the vascular tuft does not regress. And the exclusion criteria where you don't require an anti vegf is certainly where you have a zone PROP, where there's inadequate laser treatment with no fulminance, or it's a stage 4 or 5 because anti vegfs in those can be disastrous. Now, this is Dr. Michael Trize, who is no more with us, and as a science to him, and he is the icon and the father of modern day ROP treatment and surgery. To cite what he says is that he considers anti VEGF not as primary treatment. He would uh, utilize it only for patients where the foveal development is at risk because of a laser treatment. Rest everything, he would do a laser first and then do an anti VEGF if required. And these are the types of anti vegfs you all know it very well. And the most used are the ranibizumab or the razumab, because uh, that's the uh, biosimilar, and the bevacizumab, uh, which is widely used. I, biosimilars, I do not prefer, so I do not use them. And uh, the injections generally are given as a single, or maybe two injections, that would be max. But uh, nowadays, we tend to alter the dose. First, we used to give half dose of half the adult dose. But now, we give it as a 30% or a 40% uh, concentration because we don't want too much of that VEGF to be inside the eye. This is another uh, guideline. And the end point is that there has to be total regression. The blood vessels have to go to the periphery straight. The iris rigidity has to go down. The proliferation of the iris vessels have to go down. And there should be no other systemic or local complications. So these are a few examples of how in the center you see the guy with a large proliferation and within a day it has regressed with bevacizumab and these are some other examples where there is a regression seen. And suppose you don't do an, a proper follow-up or you have an ostrich attitude where you say everything is going fine, what happens? Things like these happen. And these then if it's not checked go into the crunch effect which definitely necessitates surgery and a simple case turns into a horrendous case because these, after the use of anti vegfs are very, very difficult to operate on. So in the BTROP, they have realized that there are few areas which remain avascular that's known. And recent evidence from the Rainbow Trial said that with a 0.2 milligram dose of ranibizumab, recurrence occurs in approximately 20% patients. So it necessitates careful observation every one or two. This is the line that you have to go back with. And uh, uh, these people have not noted detachments after anti vegf treatments. Uh, Dresner et al. said that there is a 7.5% of patients of ROP who have the FEVR gene. So you have to watch them carefully because they generally land up with recurrences. So what we do is that you have a general rule to check every patient one or two weeks post-injection up to 60 to 65 weeks. And suppose they still remain avascular, do a fluorescein angiography, and if the area is avascular, treat it with laser, because you don't want the dangling sword of that on your head. anti vegfs you, uh, you have to also think of the effect on organs, which we really don't know much about, because are still small, and the local and the system effects. So careful follow-up is important, and if you don't do a careful follow-up, it into horrible progressions like this where you have to do difficult surgeries for these babies. So we would say that if you want to prevent medical legal implications, just do your follow-up and document. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Karobi, for a very nice talk, very explicit, and we could understand everything, the exact timing, like you fully described two stages of ROP, which we all know, hyproxia, hypoxia, and then 
the rule of the thumb is stabilize, severe, uh, sorry, secure, and then safe treatment. And one to two weekly follow up till 60 to 65 weeks. That is what we must know. And is it that we should restrict anti VEGF only by a uh, person who is practicing ROP and not right, left, and center? Could we do something I, like I that? I think so. I think so. Because a person who is to, to ROP Diksha. really knows what is in line for that child and they will keep a proper follow up because I have a lot of seconds and third referrals who come who have been injected by people who are not actually ROP specialists and they see th that quiescence and they get into that phase where they think that everything is hunky dory and then lo and behold then the child lands up with a crunch at the sixth week, eighth week they hurriedly send it to you that do something for this child which is very sad because sometimes even after battling we can't help them. Uh, well, what is going to happen is the future is here and we have to stare at it. Everybody is going to inject. And very few would be able to laser because they will not even know how to laser. And it will even happen because now we have cameras. They will not even know very well because people are not doing buckling. So they may not know indirect ophthalmoscopy also. So I think uh, we are going to enter a different phase and era. I can see that. I can see that it is a different, but I think, <laughs> I think I Pre Pritam has to say something quickly. Yes, and Anubhav, please. I, I, I prevented Anubhav uh, from. Uh... Can you hear me? Yeah. I think so. You just uh, said what I was going to say. You know, I, I think before 2005, we, nobody would have thought or had this discussion because it was it is a gold standard. Now I think we are in a phase where we are transitioning. You know, so the, I, I, the question which I came here with was. When you have an indication when you know you're going to inject an anti vegf let's say a small pupil, rubiosis, or a very sick child. The moment you inject anti vegf within 48, 72 hours, you see the turnaround and you're so happy. But then, you, you know, when, the, when do you want to do a combination? You want to augment it with laser? Or when would you go with a monotherapy? I think this is something uh, where the jury will still be out. I, so, uh, I want to answer your question. But see, every child that we inject, because it is like you go and have your good night's sleep. You don't have to be woken, awoken very uh, vorifice around uh, two months or three months later, child develops a crunch and comes back. So that, that's that's my the answer to my question. Now my next another one question is I think how, the question how much is will you uh, laser? consensus at this time for your this thing is most of the people feel that you definitely want to follow this child. Till the time your vessels are growing and the disease is not coming back, don't do laser. Simultaneous laser or the laser immediately after, I think we have overkill. We want vessels to grow as much as possible and treat less area. I think that is what where the consensus is. Not that we have kind of firm guideline, but that is what where we are. Thank you. Just one more, one more, one more, one more question. The last one is now if you are doing laser after the injection, how much of laser? You will again fully blast it, right? You were doing no, it before no. the anti vegf era or you would do a little suboptimal laser? No, no, no. We will do the area which is avascular because when you give the injection, you buy time. So within those three, four weeks, the vessels go beyond that zone one, they land up yeah, in zone you're, two. You're, you're so the area which is avascular. Much? Obviously the avascular, but yes. like fully yes. uh, confluent? Yes. Like you do not do fomentation do. laser. Do a full <laughs> confluent laser. Laser has to be proper. That is very good. Anubhav, please. So I want to ask oh, one, no. one question. Uh, would you ah, do bi bilateral simultaneous injections? If so, when or as a routine? Yeah. So, uh, I have a baby for follow-up. Baby has hydrocephalus in ICU. Recently, or, or, or screening. Baby has zone 1 vessels. No ROP. Normal vessels. They are not progressing further. Neither worsening nor progressing. And baby has already crossed 60 weeks. So in such situation, how to deal with the treatment of such babies? Whether to inject, whether to wait, whether to... Uh, 65, list. 60 weeks? 60 weeks already Just over. do an FFA if you can. And if you can't do it, just laser. Simple. Okay. Yeah. I think we can take the questions at the... Thank you very much. Dr. Diksha, your talk, please. Thank you. So uh, my talk is on structural biometric and refractive outcomes of two treatment strategies in zone 1 ROP, a prospective randomized study. Uh, so as we were discussing, our queries are about zone 1. 
We know because it is the most severe form of disease, it is rapidly progressive and it is more susceptible to adverse structural and functional outcomes than zone 2 disease. We are not actually really bothered about zone 2 disease. Zone 1 disease is what we all have a concern about. And the beta ROP study showed that treatment with bevacizumab had actually better success and fewer recurrences in zone 1 versus zone 2 disease as compared to laser photocoagulation. But now we have the rainbow trial and it showed that uh, zone 1 versus zone 2, the success rates were lesser in zone 1 and uh, dismal actually very, very low uh, success rates with laser alone. And additional post-baseline treatments were around one-third of the patients required additional post-baseline treatments. And the follow-up was, was still 60 weeks of post-menstrual age. We found that there are several lacunae to this study. First, it does not segregate aggressive versus staged ROP. The data is only in low and very low birth weight babies, which is not the scenario in most of our uh, situations. The reports on the changes in the biometric structural ocular parameters and refractive status especially differences with regards to treatments as are inconclusive and what are the post baseline treatments are not clear from this study. So with this aim, we, uh, we planned a study to compare the structural and refractive outcomes of intravitreal ranibizumab versus laser in an exclusive cohort of eyes with zone 1 ROP. All uh, infants were uh, screened as per the national screening guidelines and those infants who develop treatment requiring ROP in zone 1 that is having aggressive features of aggressive ROP or hybrid ROP or stage 3 with or without plus or any stage with plus disease were included in the study. We ruled out, uh, we excluded infants who had congenital systemic or other ocular abnormalities, infants with media opacities or who had been treated elsewhere. So all infants who fulfilled the inclusion criteria uh, underwent a baseline red cam photograph and underwent a pre-treatment uh, examination for axial lens, keratometry, lens thickness, anterior chamber depth and retinoscopy and then they were randomized to two groups. One was laser therapy with a 532 nanometer double frequency NDAG laser or intravitreal ranibizumab and we used a 0.25 milligram because as it is we know it is shorter acting. So we used, and it is difficult to make the 0.2 milligram that has been reported for use the half strength of the adult dose. And the laser group, if there was regression, it's fine. If there was any re recurrence, the retreatment was done with a repeat laser. In the intravitreal ranibizumab group, if there was a reactivation, we gave the opportunity of doing one more injection at an interval of at, that between the treatments should be at least 28 weeks. And still, if it failed, we would do a rescue laser. And uh, this uh, biometric profile, the lens thickness anterior chamber depth was measured on the Cassia 2 anterior segment OCT in the flying baby position. The primary outcome was the number of eyes with regression of disease at week 12. And the secondary outcomes were the number of secondary in interventions and the average change in, from baseline in the biometric parameters at 3, 6 and 12 months uh, after treatment. So these are our observations. So if we look at the disease profile, uh, we feel, we find that the, both the groups were fairly matched in terms of the prematurity, the period of gestation, the timing of the treatment, the systemic risk factors. The only difference was in the birth weight in the laser group, there was slightly lower birth weight as compared to the uh, IVR group. They were also equally matched in terms of gender and whether there were single or multiple gestations. Uh, if we look at the birth weight distribution in both the groups, we find that we have the whole spectrum. We have even very low birth weights to even the higher birth weight cohorts. If we look at the baseline ROP characteristics, um, majority had aggressive ROP features. We did not have any uh, staged ROP in this cohort. So, and majority were zone 1 anterior and they were equally matched in the presence of pre-existing pre-retinal hemorrhages. So in the laser group, we found two eyes had unfavorable structural outcomes and these who had missed follow-ups and presented late. Overall, the treatment success of single session laser was 92.85%. In the intravitreal ranibizumab group, single intervention success was only 46.61%, one third record and, and eight eyes required a repeat injection. They all showed regression, however, all of these eyes had to be subsequently treated with laser. We also had unfavorable outcome in three eyes, they again missed follow-ups, two developed a cataract, one had a failure of primary therapy who was injected but required a subsequent laser. The post-menstrual age at recurrence with ranibizumab, majority record within the first 50 weeks of post-menstrual age. If you look at the change in the axial lens, we find that the laser group had shorter axial lens but however at one year they kind of equally matched and there was no significant difference. 
the lenses were thicker in the laser group, the anterior chamber depths were narrower in the laser group and the keratometry was steeper. And however, the refractive profile between the two groups at one year was no significant different and had equal percentage of high myopes in both the groups. So these are just examples of uh, an eye infant treated with primary uh, ranibizumab. This is the laser and this is one child who had a second injection. However, it did require ultimately laser because the vascularization was still incomplete at 54 weeks and if you look at the refractive error even at six months without a single spot of laser both the eyes were myopic so to conclude the overall treatment success slightly higher with laser as compared to ivr single treatment in our cohort and the overall success with ivr was 73 percent no difference in the refractive outcomes however more changes in the biometric parameters so so deferring laser by ivr seemed to un outdo some of the biometric profiles however at one year, both the groups compared. Second injection did not help in complete vascularization in zone one eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Diksha, for emphasizing that laser stays the gold standard. I think we can take questions uh -huh. during the tea time because we have. Can I ask one question? For yes, you know, uh, you know, this is uh, this is just a suggestion, and you know, for people who are not doing RP surgery. Isha, wonderful presentation. One thing I've been looking at the literature, trying to find out what is the field defect in a patient who has been lasered a little bit, who has been lasered more. There's no literature. Why can't you people from PGI come out because you have been doing these cases since a long time? And what is the field defect after injection? What is? The first thing is that when we do a laser, we have to do, we have, we treat the entire avascular periphery. So there's a near confluent laser. In the eyes that have received ranibizumab, most of them have ultimately landed up with a laser photocoagulation. So this, this we have like around two, three years follow up. So once they're a little older, we'll try to do and uh, see the difference between the two. They, no, not yet. I, I think this one it will come. Passive with passage of time, because they need to grow for field. So the, uh, these babies yeah. with anti vegf they have not grown that big. That is where the problem is. But I think uh, this data will come. Yeah, there are relative field defects. The yeah. problems are uh, in zone one okay. aggressively. There we do find that they'll have a. Yeah. I think the data is not going to be different yeah. than what has been experienced with PDR. PRP versus anti vegf alone. Ultimately, long-term visual field has been no difference in both the group. I think it is going to yeah, be the same. I think quickly we'll go. Uh, yes. Dr. Komal has. It was interesting that your IVR uh, group had a higher birth weight significantly higher birth weight as compared to the uh, the laser group and uh, use uh, the extent of myopia was the same mm -hmm. and you was because i think uh, you were saying that they had steeper cornea the laser group yeah, they had a thicker lens, lens. Thicker lens. But that both things cancelled out each other that's what i understood from it yeah and basically i think it is the disease severity which ultimately does affect the long term proactive outcomes it was the outcome of multiple injections uh, which uh, all of them required uh, a laser all of them required a Okay, laser. thank you. Yes. I had a quick two points to mention regarding when to augment the uh, treatment with laser. I think, uh, sir, the extent of avascular uh, zone after when we are treating with antivegifs makes a big difference. When we give the antivegif and we see it's just posterior vascularized area, I think that is going to recur in the future. So that is one thing which we have to keep in mind when we have to decide whether to augment it with laser. And in terms of telescreening, uh, now that we are coming up with all the real-time telescreening, I think one uh, important thing which we have to keep in mind is the artifacts which are associated. Because there is one thing where a uh, clinician is not directly examining the, uh, the indirect and the artifacts which can actually, you know, either over-diagnose uh, or sometime dangerously under-diagnose. So we have to come out with the artifacts and clinicians have to be aware especially the forest artifacts and the it can artifacts. Uh, thank you. The last one, Zarang. That's, that's this, it. This is just a comment. Uh, entire VRSI is here, team. <laughs> so it's just good. a quick comment. Uh, what we are concerned finally is the uh, vascularization of the anterior segment because that's the end point. 
so uh, even with laser there is some vascularization happening uh, the issue with anti vegf is the dose is clearly not mentioned anywhere we are doing uh, injections is just a half dose or a one quarter dose uh, there have been studies recently that mention that a very low dose helps in more vascularization because anti vegf uh, dosage is required for a certain period of time because after that the vegf is the one which is going to get uh, segment vascularized that's why there is a rising concern about the dosage so uh, there it's very very important to dilute the uh, injections whatever you are uh, getting and that has been already published that the very low dose you get a faster vascularization i think uh, all this information will come with passage of time more people are using it but what is going to happen is ultimately maybe we'll see more detachments happening uh, in these cases if we don't laser it because peripheral change is what at least i have started seeing quite a uh, all kind of changes happening because i think we were protected against that if we lasered it because we have lasered all up to uh, the periphery so uh, we will have different uh, things to manage in future with this i think uh, we should close the session i'll give it to subina because the entire uh, vrsi executive is here for for military function uh, we can have all the speakers here and just for this last picture then hand over to